Well, I love a journey, and I hope you do too, because we're on a 12-week journey walking through this book of the Bible called Romans, a letter written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Rome. And at the beginning of this book, he walks through what we call orthodoxy. What is biblical belief? What is right Christian doctrine, thinking, belief? And then from there, he moves into how should we live? And it makes perfect sense because we don't know how to live until we know what we believe. And when we know what we believe, when we have orthodox thinking, biblical thinking, it then propels us into a lifestyle of living for Jesus, of living for this God who loves us and who saved us by his grace. So on this journey, in the first week, we talked about chapter one of Romans, sin, the reality of sin, this downward spiral of sin. But then the second chapter, God moves into this hopeful vision of righteousness. He gives us a picture of God as the righteous God, and he says we can become righteous. But not by doing good things, not by following the law, not becoming judgmental of others. We can become righteous in Jesus Christ. And then chapters 3 and 4, the book of Romans kind of unfolds this idea of faithfulness, that God is faithful to us, and he invites us to put faith in him. And a number of people that Sunday morning put their faith in Jesus Christ and followed him. And when we put our faith in him, then we can become faithful in walking with him and living for him. And our faithfulness and our growth in righteousness is not what saves us from our sin. It's what happens once we know that we are cleansed by the grace of Jesus. And then last week, uh, we looked at Romans chapter 4 and 5, and Pastor Dennis walked us through this idea of peace and hope. That in this world of turmoil, in this world of struggle, and I love how Pastor Dennis just shared some of his own story. A life that had had its brokenness and pain along the way. A life that still has struggles, and yet in the midst of it all, we can walk in the hope of God and the peace of Jesus Christ. So Paul begins to kind of unfold the story and walk us along. And now, in Romans chapter 6 to 8, and that's what we're going to look at today, in Romans chapter 6 to 8, we really look at the topic of salvation. And oftentimes, as Christians, we think of salvation as something just very simple and narrow and kind of monodimensional, just one aspect. I've sinned. God saves me from my sin. That's it. That's the whole story. Well, part of the story of salvation is our sin and the salvation that God offers through the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection, the price he's paid for us. That's part of salvation. But I think what the Apostle Paul is saying to us in this journey through Romans, is it's so much more. As a matter of fact, as I studied Romans 6 to 8, I found at least 11 distinct lessons about salvation, things that we should know about salvation. And and yes, part of it is in our sin, God saves us by his grace, that we receive this by faith, and and that we follow Jesus. Yes, that's part of the story, but there's so much more. So we're going to look at 11 different things that you and I should know about salvation because God inspired these truths, and this is orthodox belief from the Word of God inspired by the Spirit of God. So here's number one. Salvation is found in Jesus alone. Salvation is found in Jesus alone. And we have to make that very clear because we live in a world where some people are saying, you know, isn't every path to God valid and legitimate? Isn't, is, isn't any religion fine? Isn't any path fine? Isn't any way of thinking fine? I mean, God is loving. Wouldn't he just sort of sweep all of humanity up into his saving plan? Well, the truth is God offers salvation to all who will believe. But we must put our faith in Jesus Christ. We learn this in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. We're going to focus on verses 3 and 4. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open your Bible. If you have an iPad or a a phone that has a Bible on it, a Bible app, would you open to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Listen to these words. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So when we were baptized, we die with him. And it's a sign that our old life has ended. Verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This picture of baptism is this picture of going under the water and dying to an old life and rising again. Well, the only one who died and rose again is Jesus Christ. 
And this picture is that our salvation can be found in Jesus Christ because he came in our place, because he died for our sins, because he rose again in glory. He can offer us his righteousness. He can offer us cleansing from our sins. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's kind of pulling together all that's been taught and clarifying. Salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone. You may have been taught or heard somebody else say, well, you know, Jesus is a way to God. That's not an accurate way of putting it. Jesus is the way to God, the only way. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Pastors didn't make that up. Churches didn't make that up. Those are the words of our Savior. So here's a question for you. Have you found salvation in the person of Jesus Christ? Have you come to that point of salvation? If you have, if you've come to the cross, if you've confessed your sin, if you've received Jesus Christ's grace and been saved by his grace, then I want to encourage you to rejoice, to celebrate, to give praise to God for his grace and his goodness. This day, if you're listening to these words and you say, I have received Jesus Christ. I am saved by his grace. You should be overwhelmed with joy at God's goodness and this beautiful gift you have. If you've not yet received the grace of God through Jesus Christ, if you're trying to work your way to God by good works, if you're trying to be legalistic or judge others, and you think that'll get you there, if you're trying some other religious path that somebody said, well, this is kind of a nice way to go, understand that Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I've spent the last 43 years of my life as a follower of Jesus, having grown up in a home with no faith that was very resistant to things of faith, with a dad who was a computer graphics designer, a mom who was a math and science teacher, kind of intellectual atheism, intellectual agnosticism. And what I've shared with you as a congregation on many occasions is that one of my greatest desires when I became a Christian, when I, when I was able to receive the gift of salvation would be to see my family come to know Jesus. And one by one, the five kids in my family, one by one, became followers of Jesus Christ. Three of us have gone into different kinds of ministry. My brother's a worship leader. My sister, Lisa, helps people move from unemployment to employment, but does it from a clear Christian worldview. And I'm a pastor. And, and, and my dad has kind of often out loud just kind of been baffled. He says, you know, I tried to raise my kids the best I could, and they all became Christians. They've gone into ministry. He, he didn't raise us that way. And so over the last 43 years, I have shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with my dad over and over again. I, I, my brother and my sisters have shared the love of Jesus. My dad and I have had countless spiritual conversations. But just a couple of days ago, I had gotten word that my dad's cancer had come back. There were two new spots. It's metastasized. It's in his blood. And I just thought, I need to get there as quick as I can. And Sherry and I flew to the East Coast. We flew to North Carolina to be with my dad. And the first day we were with him, uh, he was kind of hazy, and he'd be kind of alert for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. He just had eight weeks of chemo and radiation, and his body's worn down. So that day he had maybe little snippets of 10 or 15 minutes where he was kind of, kind of attentive but a little bit hazy. But I had prayed, God, give him a moment of absolute clarity in his mind and in his thinking. And the next day, Sherry and I had a couple hours just alone with my dad. And for about an hour and a half, like just the breath of the Holy Spirit filling him and waking him up, my dad kind of sat up in his chair, and we talked together for an hour and a half. And we talked about Jesus. I showed him uh, the book Organic Outreach for Ordinary People, a book I, I wrote, and I showed him a copy of that book uh, in, in Telugu, in Hindi, in Tamil, in Spanish, and in English, in five different languages. I said, Dad, did you ever think that your son would write a book about sharing Jesus that would be used all over the world? And he said, not when you were in junior high and high school. And I said, well, nobody would have thought that back then. And we kind of laughed. But I said, Dad, my greatest desire is that the people I love would know Jesus, that everyone would know Jesus. But I said, Dad, I've been praying for you for 43 years. And I reminded him that two times ago when I was with him, we had talked about the gospel, and I'd asked him where he was at. And he had, he had said to me, he said, you know, I'm, I'm more open than I've ever been. But he wasn't ready to receive Jesus. And then I said, Dad, last time I was with you, 
we, I talked about how you can know the story of Jesus in eight words. You know, know God's love and our problem, sin, and God's solution, Jesus, his death and resurrection, and our response to receive the gift by faith. And I, I walked through that gospel story. I said, Dad, I shared that with you last time I was with you. And I said, Dad, where are you at? Are you ready to receive Jesus? And you said to me, and this is how my dad talks, you said to me, well, I think I'm slowly drifting towards your way of seeing things. And I remember thinking, Dad, drift faster. Dad, start paddling. Dad, you know, draw near to Jesus. But we walked through the gospel again just, just, just a couple days ago. And at the end of sharing the gospel, I said, Dad, is there any reason that you wouldn't receive Jesus right now? And he, he looked at me and said, I can't think of any. And my heart sort of almost skipped a beat. And I said, Dad, would you be ready right now to pray and confess your sins and receive Jesus as your Savior and the leader of your life? And my dad looked at me and he said, absolutely. And I've asked that question many times. He's never been there. He's never been ready. My dad is a man of integrity, and he won't say it unless he means it. And so I went back, and, and I just said, Dad, I want to make sure you understand what we're talking about. And I kind of just reviewed, and I said, are you ready to make that commitment? And he looked at me, and a second time, he said the word, absolutely. And I had a chance to pray with my dad through the simple prayer of confession of sin, of receiving Jesus Christ, of asking him to wash him clean and asking Jesus to lead his life. And it was glorious and it was beautiful. Salvation, yes, it's that moment of receiving Jesus, the one and only way to the Father. It's bigger than that, but it is that. And I need to tell you right now, for all of you at Shoreline Church that have been praying for me as I've been walking with my dad and praying for my dad and praying for Sherry as she's just been a great daughter-in-law loving him, praying for my siblings as we've been sharing our faith. Rejoice with us that a lost sheep has come home. We're celebrating that and we'll continue celebrating that for all eternity. But, but the, the message of the Bible, the message of Romans is there's not just any old way to God. There is a way, there is a truth, there is a life found in Jesus Christ. And if you've not yet received that, his arms are open and his grace is enough. And, and I would actually, I would encourage you if, you, if you're saying, you know, I want to know more about receiving Jesus or I think I'm ready to receive Jesus, but I want to talk with someone, would you just text the word learn? Meaning I want to learn how to become a Christian. I want to learn how to take steps toward Jesus. Text the word to the number you see right there and we will contact you in the next 24 to 48 hours. And we'll have someone connect with you and talk about what it means to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. So as you're listening today and you've not yet come to Jesus and been saved by his grace, you can do that if you'll just reach out to him because he's already reached out to you. Number two, salvation in his, uh, in his sacrifice is final and gives us freedom. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is final. It is done. It is finished. His work is completed on the cross. And you find freedom. Look with me at Romans 6, verses 8 through 11. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. There's that sense of completion. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He died once for all. He paid the price. And if you come to faith in Jesus, you come to the one who's already resolved the situation. He's paid the price. We just receive the gift. And then he gives us freedom. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. We are set free from sin. There's still a battle. We'll talk about that in a moment. But we are no longer slaves of sin. Whatever had control of your life before, it doesn't anymore. And you might say, man, it's still a struggle. It may be a struggle, but it doesn't have control. You are not owned by sin. You are not controlled by sin. You are under the lordship of Jesus Christ if you put your faith in him. He paid the price. So here's a question for you. Are you living in the freedom Jesus offers you? Are you living and walking every day in that freedom to say sin does not have mastery over me? I have one master. I have one Lord. I have one leader. His name is Jesus, and he has set me free. Walk in that freedom. And then third, the Apostle Paul teaches us this, that the salvation we have in Jesus breaks shackles 
and brings gifts. There's freedom, but also there's gifts, and one gift in particular. We find this in Romans 6, 15 to 23. Let's look at part of that text. Look with me at verse 17 in your Bible, in Romans chapter 6. But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. We are free from sin and we, it says we're slaves of righteousness. We cannot not walk in righteousness. Even when we don't know we're doing it. We walk in righteousness because Christ has filled us with his righteousness, but we grow in righteousness. And then now move down to verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. That's the cost of sin, death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift of God, the gift of grace is eternal life. Our salvation is a gift from God, never earned, not deserved, offered through the gift of Jesus Christ through his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection. And there's no better gift than the love of God and the grace of God and the righteousness of God and a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So here's a question for you. And ponder this for a moment. Do you understand the greatness of the gift of grace? Do you live your life overwhelmed by this amazing grace, how sweet the sound, by the amazing good grace of God? And you realize that he's freely given you himself and his love and his friendship and freedom and cleansing and new life. It's staggering. Walk in that grace. Understand that grace. What is salvation? What's this all about? Well, here's the fourth thing the Apostle Paul teaches us. Salvation frees us from the law and binds us to Jesus. In the ancient world, they felt, they felt confined by the, by the law, that they had to follow the law to be made righteous. And what they they'd learned is that, that grace sets us free. It sets us free to actually follow Jesus and walk in obedience, but not, not that we have to be obedient to be loved. We're loved as we are. We come to know Jesus, and then we walk in his ways. We're set free from legalism. Romans 7, 4, we read this. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. You died to that. That's part of your past. Through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. We don't belong to the law. We belong to Jesus. In order that we might bear fruit for God. We are bound to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. Not to legalism. Not to the law. And some Christians spend all their time trying to follow rules and regulations as if that's what saves them. We're bound to Jesus. And as we walk with him, yes, we are transformed. Yes, we learn to walk in new ways. Yes, we change our attitudes and our words and our motivations change. But that's what happens because Jesus is in us and he's transforming us. Here's a question. Are you bound up in legalism? Are you caught up and bound up in legalism? Do you say, well, I know I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, but uh, if I don't do this, this, or this, I think I'm a horrible person, a horrible Christian. Or if I do this, this, and this, I don't think God loves me anymore. That's being bound up in legalism. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, you are washed clean. And when you understand that, you are freed to be bound to Jesus and to walk in his ways. Your life will look better when you're set free from legalism. You'll actually follow Jesus more closely when you're set free from legalism. He died to cut the ties of legalism, to set you free and let you walk in freedom. And when you walk freely with Jesus, you desire to live for him. And you're propelled towards holiness and faithfulness to him. What is salvation? What do we learn about it in these chapters of Romans? Now we're in chapter 7. Salvation is not the end of temptation. Oh, I wish this was different, but it's true. Salvation is not the end of temptation. Because I'm saved doesn't mean, well, I'm never tempted. I never struggle anymore. Romans 7, 7 through 25 addresses this. But we're going to kind of look at the heart of this in Romans 7, beginning in verse 15. 
And the Apostle Paul is talking about what he feels at times and what all of us feel at times. I know there's some theologians who have talked about that Paul must have written these words before he was a Christian because once he was a Christian, he could never feel this way. But here's the deal. Before he was a Christian, he wouldn't have cared about sinning. It's only after we're Christians that our heart cares. This is the heart of a Christian who's dealing with the fact that temptation still exists and we still struggle. Listen to the heart of Paul. Listen to these words and see if you ever feel this way. Romans 7.15, Paul writes, inspired by the Spirit of the living God, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That means without Jesus in myself. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. But I, in my own power, I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And he goes on to say, wretched man that I am, I'm struggling. This is so difficult. This is so painful. I want to do what honors God, but it's still a struggle. Here's the fifth lesson about salvation. Salvation is not the end of temptation. Look at it this way. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, we read about Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, being tempted by the devil. He didn't give in to the temptation, but he was tempted. See, even Jesus, who was perfect, still came under temptation. So Paul is saying, there's still temptation. There's still struggles. And legalism won't set us free from that. But walking in the power of Jesus day by day, and, and hear this, month by month and year by year, as you grow to love him more, as the Spirit is unleashed in your heart, more and more you can do the things you know he wants you to do and not do the things you know you shouldn't do but there's still a battle, and that's why we need grace. One of my sisters, when she finally gave her heart to Jesus, she said to me, I'm afraid that now that I'm a Christian, I might do something where I fall short and, and, and don't live for God and do something wrong. And I said, oh, I said, you will. We all do. That's why we need grace. I said to her, I'm a pastor, and there's still times that I can say what Paul said here. But the difference is I live in grace. I don't deal with a guilt and shame. I put it at the feet of Jesus. I know that I'm cleansed and I stand up and I move on. And some of you need to do that right now. Some of you are living under this sense of when you struggle, when you fall, that God then doesn't love you anymore. Not true. He knew everything about you before Jesus died for you, all of your sins, all of your wrongs, and he still loved you and he still died for you. That's amazing grace. So here's a question for you. Where is the battle raging? Where is that real battle in your life? Where is that area that you say, that thing I don't want to do, the temptation is still there, and maybe sometimes I'm drawn into it. The good thing I want to do, I'm tempted to not do it. Then bring those things to God and say, God, I'm not a slave of sin. I don't have to live in that anymore. Give me power to walk in a new way. But know the temptation, in some ways, you'll battle with maybe for all the days of your life, some kind of temptation. The enemy's not going to quit coming and enticing us. But we stand in the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, and we can say no. And then we move to the sixth thing, and it ties right into this. Salvation frees us from condemnation. So when we do struggle, and we do stumble, and, we, and the enemy starts to go, oh, you're a loser, you're nothing, God doesn't love you, and he starts to speak words of condemnation, we say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say, now there's just a little bit of condemnation. It says there's none. If you've walked in Jesus Christ, if you've come to the cross, you've received his grace. Even when you stumble and fall, there is no condemnation. Why? It's washed away. God has dealt with it. You are cleansed. You are new. You are loved by God. Wait. Even when I struggle, even when I fall, even when my mind wanders to places I don't even wish it wouldn't go and I don't even know how my mind got there or why it would think that, no condemnation. Even when I do something really stupid and irresponsible, no condemnation. Now, there may be consequences that we do dumb things in this world, but God has forgiven us, forgiven us by his grace and washed us clean. 
No condemnation. Do you believe the lies of the enemy? The enemy loves to lie and tell us you're condemned by God. You're not loved by God. Do you believe those lies? Or do you hear the truth of God? God says your shame, not only is your sin dead, your shame is dead. You don't live in shame anymore. And if you are, you're not understanding the grace of Jesus. Your guilt is gone. But I've done wrong things. Yes, but we don't live under that guilt and the blanket of guilt. You're set free by Jesus Christ. And you need to see yourself the way that Jesus does. Cleansed, beloved, the way the Father does. The Father sees you and me through the shed blood of Jesus and through his righteousness. And when God looks at you and me, all he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Not because we followed laws and obligations, but we came and threw ourselves on God and said, by your grace, save me. By your mercy, call me your own. And God says, I've been waiting for you to cry out to me. And from that moment on, There is therefore now no condemnation for you or me if we're in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Don't believe the lies. Walk in this freedom. And then the Apostle Paul gives us this amazing news in chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. That salvation unleashes the power and the presence of the Spirit of the living God. When we're saved, yes, our sins are washed away, but all these other things happen. The Spirit of God moves into us and His power becomes our own. Look at verse 10 of Romans 8. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your Mortal bodies. Listen to this. Because of his spirit who lives in you. If you're a Christian, you are the dwelling place of the spirit of the living God. That the third person of the Trinity, our God, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit dwelling in you if you're a Christian? That's good news. That's glorious. That's the fruit of salvation. He lives in you. So a question. How can you walk more powerfully in the spirit of the living God? How do you walk in the presence and the power of the spirit? Let me give you three Ps. If you're a note taker, write these down. Partner with the spirit. Say every day, say, spirit of God, what are you doing? Where are you going? Hey, I'm with you. I'm coming along. Partner with the spirit of God. Spirit of God, where are you at work around me in the world? I want to be part of it. And step into that. The second P, the power of the Spirit. Ask, Spirit of God, give me fresh power, a fresh wind of your presence. I am struggling in this area. I'm feeling tempted here. Give me your power, Spirit of God. I don't have enough power. He will give you power as you ask for it and as you walk in it. Partner with the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, and then number three, the presence of the Spirit. Will you notice the breath of the Spirit, the whisper of the Spirit, the strength of the Spirit? Wouldn't it be amazing if we walked through every day with a sense that we're not alone because the spirit of the very living God is in us and with us. He is. He is. We need to notice it. Pay closer attention. In those difficult moments when you're struggling, quiet yourself and say, Spirit of God, let me notice that you're with me. Number eight, salvation makes us children and family. When we're saved, our whole relational world changes. We see this in Romans 8, 12 through 17, but look with me at verse 15 and following. The spirit you receive, this is the Holy Spirit who lives in us, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, to daughtership. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in the sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Here's a question. Do you receive the invitations of your Abba? You are invited to be part of a family, the body of Christ. I hope as soon as you can, you gather with us again. 
whether it's in the courtyard or in the building here, to be together, to pray together, to love each other well. You are part of a family, and God is your Father. Walk in that reality with confidence. And then Paul goes on, and he says something fascinating and troubling and hard to understand, and even for some people hard to accept, but it's true. Number nine, salvation outweighs suffering. If you have put it on the scale and, and you put it all of our suffering and God's salvation, and you're going to say, okay, my suffering, God's salvation, it goes like this every time. My suffering, God's salvation, boom. The scale goes like that every time. So here's how the Apostle Paul says this in Romans 8, 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There is a glory that God is revealing in us, through us, and that God will reveal eternally to us that outweighs whatever our suffering and struggles are. And you might think, well, what does this guy Paul know about my struggling and my suffering? Well, you read his story and you find out that he was beaten again and again and again for his faith. He was shipwrecked. He was, he was uh, stoned. He was rejected. He was persecuted by Jews and non-Jews. He went through so much, it's hard to acknowledge. And Paul said, but when I get a glimmer, a glimpse of the salvation of Jesus and the glory that he is bringing now and forevermore, my sufferings and his salvation, boom, the scales tip. So keep your eyes on his salvation and what it means, whatever you're going through. Now let me say something very clearly. He's not saying your suffering doesn't matter and it's not heavy. Man, it may be incredibly heavy, but compared to the glory of God, God's glory always wins. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through. Number 10, and this is beautiful and hope-filled. Salvation rewrites your story. Our story is rewritten when we have salvation in Jesus Christ. Look with me at Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, in all things, in, say it with me, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God can bring about good. So here's my question for you. Are you reading the old story or the new story? The old story is, in all things, I suffer, I struggle, and it's just life is hard. The new story, when you come to faith in Jesus, salvation gives you a new story. That God works for the good of those who love him in all things. So do you look and say, God, whatever I face, you're writing a story greater than what I can see. I'm not saying that God causes sin. I'm not saying that God causes evil, because that's not true. God is not the author of sin. God is not the author of evil. But God can bring good through anything you face. And that's a new story. What if we lived every day and every moment profoundly aware that whatever I face, whatever comes my way, that I know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. God can bring good out of this. When you discover that, when you know that, then when things are tough, you start looking and saying, okay, Lord, what can you bring out of this? And in the middle of it, it's hard to see. But on the other side, we can often see, and on the other side of this life, we will fully see that God has brought about good even through the toughest things we face. And then 11, the final thing that Paul shares, and this is in Romans 8, 31 to 39. Salvation gives victory and security. If you are saved in Jesus Christ, there is victory, there is security, there is strength and power. And I'm not going to give any commentary at all on this. I'm just going to let the biblical text speak to your heart. Listen to these words from Romans 8, 37 to 39. He says, this is coming to the end of this whole discussion about salvation. And he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You want to talk about security. Nothing can take away the grace of God given in Jesus Christ. Not you, not me, not the forces of hell, not the things of this world. 
When you have salvation, you have security in who God is and what he's done for you. Here's my question. Are you living as more than a conqueror? Are you living in that confidence that you are not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror because of Christ in you? Are you walking in his victory, in his security, in the peace of his presence? On this journey that we're walking together through the book of Romans, in this first half of the journey, talking about orthodoxy, we have come to understand that salvation, yes, it is putting our faith in Jesus, receiving his grace, and having our sins washed away. Absolutely. But it is so much more. Oh God, our Savior, we pray that we will walk in the confidence and security of salvation in your name. That we will see salvation, not just as that thing that, that happened in one moment, but that, that salvation is transformed transforming us every day by the power of your spirit with confidence that we are more than conquerors, that you're rewriting the story, that whatever we suffer, your goodness and grace outweighs it by far. God, your salvation isn't just that one moment. It's every moment of every day we walk in the glory of your salvation. So help us to do that and to shine the light of that salvation, that life-changing, world-transforming good news of Jesus that we might shine that light everywhere we go at all times. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a few, uh, a few guidelines on some stuff and, and a few invitations. If you need prayer for anything at all, anything at all, uh, will you call the number you see there on the screen and just uh, check in with us? And we want to pray for you or for anyone you love and care about, and we believe there's power in prayer. If you're new, would you text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen? Just text, text the word welcome. We want to follow up and give you a warm, personal welcome and just thank you for joining us. We're digging deeper into this topic of, of salvation on our Shoreline Conversations podcast. If you haven't jumped into one of our podcasts, this would be a great one to start on because we're going to get into a lot more depth of things that we could just touch on in a sermon, but in the podcast we can talk and kind of turn it over, look at it from the other side and, and learn together. So go to Shoreline Conversations, download the podcast and be part of that with us. If you want information about anything, our team is ready to answer your questions about the church, what's coming up, when are we starting this or that, why is this happening, any question about the church, send it in, and we'll do all we can to respond to you as quickly, quickly as we can. And I also want to remind you that you can text the word LEARN, L-E-A-R-N. Text that word to the number you see on the screen one more time. And we will respond to you if you want to learn more about Jesus or if you want to learn what, how to become a follower of Jesus. You say, I'm ready. I need someone to lead me in that process of praying to receive Jesus. We're here for you. Text the word learn and we will get right back to you and have a conversation with you. I'm going to send you off with a word of blessing. And if you're able to do so, wherever you are at home, on your own or with a group of people, would you stand? And would you turn your hands upward like this just to receive this blessing? As we close this time together, May the presence of the risen Jesus Christ, the Savior of all who will believe, may his presence fill you, empower you, and guide you. May his spirit overwhelm you with his presence and power. And may you walk in the joy of his salvation given freely to you by grace. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday either here online or in the courtyard. God bless you. Have a great week. This is a clip from the latest episode of our Shoreline Conversations podcast. Stick around to the end to find out how to listen or watch the full episode. I don't dare to go where I, I know pastors have written books about you know, showing if a person's truly saved or not. And, yeah. And I don't have the, um, I don't have whatever, uh, Whatever gene that is that thinks that you can, that someone thinks they can decide exactly who's saved and who's not by looking at the outside. Yeah. But I believe that internally, if we've received Jesus and it was authentic, we belong to him. The spirit lives in mm -hmm. us. The father and the son wrap their hands around us. And even the greatest times of struggle, uh, we, we don't lose our salvation. We don't run away from God. We may struggle. We may push back, but God does not let us go. Yeah. And, uh, and some people say, well, then you're, then, then how do you know you, well, you'll know the fruit of it later. And later on, you look at the life, you know, if it was real or not. Right. I, I'm not going to try to figure all that out, yeah. but I do believe that the scriptures are clear enough that if a person truly has faith in Jesus Christ, they belong to him. Right. And not only can no one snatch us from the Father's hand, we can't snatch ourselves from the Father's mm -hmm. hand or from the Son's hand. Yeah.
We can't drive the Spirit of God out of us uh, if we've truly come to a point of salvation. Right. That's my sense from my understanding of Scripture. I have, I, I need to say, I have dear friends who I love and respect who come from a different stream of looking at things, and, and I believe that they're biblical, they love Jesus, and they will say, no, I think a person can become a Christian, lose their salvation, backslide. I, can I tell you a danger with that mm -hmm. is that I think when you believe that, you spend a lot of time uh, going, am I saved? Am I not? Is what, is what I did big enough and bad enough that I lost my salvation? Mm -hmm. So I got to get resaved every time I stumble. What if I believed and then I lost my salvation and then something happens and I die and I didn't get my salvation back? Boy, the level of insecurity. You know, when, when Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation in Jesus Christ, when he says that we're set free from, from sin and from the shame of sin, mm -hmm. I think people like that can end up living in a lot of shame, a lot of sin, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty instead of the confidence of the work of Jesus. Yeah. You can find the full episode on our website, YouTube channel, channel or any major app or platform that hosts podcasts. Just search for Shoreline Conversations and be sure to let us know what you think with a review and subscribe. 